Welcome to the Bowden Education Autumn Podcast Series, where we talk to a range of people making a significant contribution to education. Our podcasts are informal and aim to inspire you, lift you up and get you thinking. Today, I'm delighted to be chatting to Andy Taylor, known to many as Mr. T's NQTs, picking his brains about the ECT years. And he was a teacher and senior leader in primary schools before, before moving into teacher education at the University of Worcester, where Andy, in addition to contributing to teacher education programmes, has a focused role on mental development and ECT support. I also have the privilege of co-hosting Bowden Education's monthly ECT network with Andy, which we'll chat about later. Welcome, Andy. Right, Catherine, lovely to be here with you. Thanks for having me on. So let's start um, by finding out a little bit about you. Um, can you talk to us and share with us a little bit about your career to date? So I think you kind of captured a lot of it in a nutshell. So I started teaching um, about 20 years ago now in um, schools in Gloucestershire and um, worked in that area and then I think about six years in picked up my first role as, a, as an NQT mentor and that's where that kind of love of supporting people in their early career teachers really started for me. I did that then for 10 years in different schools picking up um, NQTs at different points as they were called back then mm. and ended up mentoring about 17 in that 10 year time. By the end of my time in primary schools, I was uh, as a deputy head and done that role for six years. I decided I needed um, a new challenge and then looked to as to what would in, inspire me further. And that work with NQTs and those in the early stages of their teaching career really kind of spoke to me. So then moved that transition to uh, initial teacher education with the University of Worcester and uh, yeah, loving every minute of it. Really good. So that leads me on to think you've been in education 20 years. Lots of people don't make it that far um, now. Uh, what inspires you to continue working within education? I think initially it was always about that impact on pupils and seeing pupils kind of develop and flourish. And then it became seeing teachers develop and flourish and knowing that actually, you know, everybody needs their champion, whether you're a, a teacher, a child or everything, you need somebody that's going to kind of believe in you and put that faith in you. And I've always found that something I've enjoyed doing and that that sense of everybody can achieve and everybody can get better, everybody can kind of improve. And it's just that investment in people that I've really enjoyed mm. um, kind of seeing them then flourish, seeing them kind of develop as a teacher, growing in their confidence and their skills and then watching them innovate and then going on to supporting others. So my very first NQT actually um, works at the university alongside me as a, as a lecturer there. So it's again, it's that investment in people that allows people to kind of to, to go on and then make a further impact. That constant like trickle down effect, which is just, yeah, incredible, really. That must be really nice having them work alongside you, but also slightly weird. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And do they reflect, have you ever had a conversation about their NQT experience when you were supporting them or, or have they not <laughs> divulged their thoughts on that? Just don't mention it at all. Um, it's interesting. I worked with them for this, I stayed in the um, same school as them for about four or five years and ended up kind of just um, working, teaching kind of parallel alongside them for a long time. And often we kind of sit and reflect and kind of share those experiences and um, occasionally attend some of the training courses together. And it's always fascinating to hear from that other perspective and other NQTs that I've mentioned have gone on to be deputy heads and things like that. Often they'll get back in touch and they'll kind of say like, oh, you know, you know, you've always believed in me. Thank you very much for that. This is kind of where I am. Would you write a reference for me? Would you be able to talk about these sorts of things? And, you know, that again, that contact that you have and those relationships that you build, and that investment in people, you know, it's just... Yeah, it's incredible, really. But you're right. It's nice sometimes just to sit back and reflect on those kind of shared experiences to where you are now. Yeah. And so this morning, I really want to pick your brains about um, being an ECT. And I think whilst we probably those people listening understand maybe an ECT themselves, um, 
I think there's still a lot of confusion as to the entitlement, what's expected, lots of questions are floating around. And I know you pick up huge numbers of those because you're tagged into all of those kind of questions on, on Twitter. So, um, and you do an awful lot of work in, in both in your day job, but also on, on Twitter to support early career teachers. But what to you is an ECT in a nutshell? In a nutshell, it's that anybody, I think, in their early stages of their teaching career. So the term ECT is used for those in their first and second years of, of teaching as it's kind of more formally, formal kind of bracket. So anybody in first and second year of teaching, they're labelled as a, an ECT, an early career teacher. But that concept of being an early career teacher, I think, does span into initial teacher education. So anybody kind of developing and learning their craft before mm. achieving QTS. And equally, I think those beyond, I don't think you, even three, four years in, I think, you know, if we're thinking about a 40 year career, you're still very early in your teaching career. And I think there's that continued development throughout that time. But, you know, the, the term ECT does particularly relate to those two years, but I think it does span kind of a greater kind of about a width of years than its official label does. Mm. I would agree completely. I think it, it does encapsulate the, the right from the beginning of the, their career being their first day on their teacher education programme, be that an undergraduate or post uh, PG, PGCE. So they that's when their early career starts. And I think I completely agree. I don't think it, the early career ends at the end of that two years in school. I think it carries on at least, I would say, if you're looking for a time frame, at least to year, end of year five. I agree. I agree. And I think the, the principle behind the um, early career framework and the ECT being made two years was that recognition of you know, that historically that NQT year being one year and then it was kind of like, right, that's it. You're on your own. Yeah. There's that continued sense of investment in there, which I think is really valuable. But I think it, it still needs to continue. Mm. You know, we're all very aware of that, you know, retention of teachers that you know, 30 percent go within the first five years with continuing that investment in people kind of throughout that time that continued cpd that continued nurture that investment in them will pay dividends in the future if we can mm. keep that investment going and of course you're going to come across situations uh for many years that are your first time of coming across that so it's that having someone to go to so what can an ect though expect thinking about those first two years what can they expect from their first two years in school so as an early career teacher, teacher entering um, your kind of getting your first job, starting a, a school, whether that be January, Easter, September, wherever you are in your application cycle, you should be given a named mentor and a named induction tutor. And they hold similar but slightly different roles. Both of them can signpost CPD to you. Both of them can invest in you and are there to support you. Your mentor is their role is very much to deliver the early career framework materials and support you with that early career framework development. So they will be doing weekly low stakes observations of you focused on whatever the content is of the early career framework that's being focused on in the, that module that you're studying at the moment. Your induction tutor, their role is more of a, an assessment or I don't want to use the word judgment, but ultimately that's what they do. They will make those judgments to get a view against the teacher standards. But equally, they are still there to support you to gain wider CPD beyond the early career framework. And I think sometimes we can, that early career framework is a good batch of CPD, but it's not the only CPD that you know early career teachers may need. And while you are looking at a specific module, it's very focused on a particular bit of content. So behavior management is the uh, module being covered at the moment by those starting their first year. But actually, there may be wider CBD that you need. Perhaps you've got uh, pupils in there with very specific needs that might need more focused support. And so it's seeking that wide opportunity. So it, uh, and there may be pedagogical approaches you're looking to develop, but you need to be able to go out to the wider school and actually beyond your school to be able to observe and to um, interact with others and gain from other situations. So that's your induction tutor's role to go beyond the ECF for that wider CPD. They'll also... Um, like I said, make that judgment of you against the teacher standards and you'll have two formal assessment points, one at the end of the first year and one at the end of the second year where that final decision is made of whether you're meeting the teacher standards. In between those, on the terms when you're not having those formal assessments, you've got um, progress review points where 
a form is completed and then an indication is made as to your trajectory against the teacher standards at that point. And again, identifying strengths, areas for development and celebrating kind of the progress that you're making, but also thinking, OK, how can we support you and develop you further? Mm. And then as an ECT, then your entitlement in the first year is you'll receive a 10 percent reduction in your timetable, um, which for primary colleagues is slightly easier. It tends to be half a day. Um, for secondary colleagues, it's always a, it's a, quite a complicated um, formula that they use. It's a 10% reduction in line with another teacher in your school who doesn't hold any management responsibilities. Whatever the, normal is, the norm is for teachers in your school that don't hold any responsibilities, you, get 10, you should have 10% less than they do. And obviously that varies from school to school. It depends on how many sessions a day they have. Or, you know, so it's quite a complicated one, but it should always be that 10% less. And that's for you to engage in the early career framework, but also in that wider CPD opportunities as well. Yeah, and that 10% is on top of the 10% PPA that staff already get. So it all is. staff members would get that. And then so as an ECT, essentially you have 20% remission time for planning preparation and engaging with your ect the early career framework and so on exactly and that's it and then so, the second oh sorry okay. go on. no no go on you carry on and then i'll follow up that's all right yeah <laughs> um in the second year there's a slight reduction in that and it comes down to five percent um of a reduced timetable and schools then manage that in very different ways i've spoken to schools where some will be given um, an hour a week to engage in that some will be given half a day a fortnight some will even be given a day a month depending okay. on how that works so there isn't a a specific kind of structure for that it can be uh, the flexibility of the school to make sure that that happens the discretion of the school and um, to be able to fit in with how their workload works but it's really important that you still have that time in your second year mm. because you're still engaging with the early career framework and you're you still here support things that you need to engage with so you need that time anyway for that exactly. so that's really important for e ECTs that are listening yeah. or for those people listening that are currently in teacher education and are, are, you know will be looking to move into into their first role to just check that they are getting their entitlement of remission for being an ECT and that it isn't taken away and I think that's really important that it's ring fenced and it can't be taken away because there's a meeting they need to go to it is remission it is it is in its protected time and I often get asked about this that you know we're on a school trip that day should I be having my ECT time back absolutely yes you should because mm. it's a, it a statutory time and it's you know there may be you know you may need to be flexible in school particularly if you're in a very small school that ability to adapt very quickly may not be be there to give you the back kind of immediately but you should be seeking to you know receive that time as Kathy said you know it's there to protect your time to engage with the ECF materials and develop your own professional development so it is there to protect it is protected time but always yes absolutely you should always seek it back the other question I often get asked is um about if you're going on training days where does that fit in? Well, actually, because the ECT time is protected to engage with your CPD, if you're going on a, a training course, actually that's an effective use of your ECT time because it's an investment in your CPD. So you wouldn't gain that time back in that sense because it's your CPD investment, not just you're off on a school trip or you're being pulled yeah. to, a, to a random meeting here because you need to be able to represent the views. Mm -hmm. It is that CPD, so that would fall under that ECT time. Yeah, and if you feel that you're not, or you're you've got questions about it, that's when you should really um, have a chat to your mentor. That would yes. be a mentor type question, not not your tutor. And I would, uh, the induction tutor ultimately holds responsibility for the program that you're in, so your induction. And this is where I think there still is um, a slight confusion that the ECT induction and the ECF materials run parallel. They're not. Mm -hmm the same they are kind of mutually exclusive things so the mentors focus role is on the ecf really however they can engage with other cpd with you if it's an issue with your induction so things mm -hmm. like not getting your ect time then it would be your induction tutor right. that would hold okay. that responsibility in that role and that for um in that way if you are continually 
not getting that time or you don't feel you're meeting your expectations then the next protocol above that would be the appropriate body and mm. they are the people that all the paperwork goes off to they're appointed by the dfe to be able to sign off um paperwork they also undertake qa and often will be a delivery partner for whatever ecf materials that you're using um, but there should be a named contact for you um, mm -hmm. either that they've been in touch to kind of signpost you where meetings are or they've been, their name should be given to you and you can contact them to seek support and that's part of their role as well as to support you as an ECT as well as supporting the school with the process of ECT induction. Yeah and it, it you know it is quite complex you've got these it different is. roles who's to go to for what and so on. Another question I often see or indeed have been asked in the past is can you start your ECT at any point in the year, firstly? So it doesn't have to be September. Yes. So you can. But this is the more complex one, is for those people that either start in a school and then things aren't working out in that school and they look to move, or have taken up um, sort of a term supply, can they embark on the start? Can they start counting off, if you like, a term or whatever of their ECT um, two-year programme? Yes, so as long as you know that you are there for at least a whole term, you can start early career teaching induction. You can't, so things that wouldn't apply. So if you were saying you started a, a long-term supply of, of a half term, and then at the end of that, towards the end of that first half term, the head teacher comes along and says, OK, well, actually now, you know, that member of staff isn't returning. We can extend it now to the full term. That can't be counted retrospectively. Right. So that wouldn't count. However, if you start off and say you're, you're here for a whole term, then, yes, you should have your ECT provision put in place for you. If, as Catherine said, you know, you've started that journey in a school and, you know, you maybe you've got to that first half term and thinking, hmm, not quite sure. You know, you do that first term, you think, actually, I don't really feel this is the right school for me. This is, and absolutely, you know, countless people yeah. I know have been in, in that situation and that's absolutely fine. I think it's it's not thinking teaching isn't for me. It's actually thinking, is this the right environment for me, the right setting for me? And just because it's not the right setting for you doesn't mean it's not the right setting for somebody else. But it's about if you get to that point, as long as you've completed a whole term that's then banked and secured and that will be taken off your the rest of your ECT um, induction period. So we've looked at that two years, mm -hmm. you've done one term out of six effectively. You can then pick up the next five terms wherever you go. If for some reason, depending on the way your contract works, you do a term and a half. Mm. can fill in an interim form and that half term can be counted but it has to be done as an interim form um, to be able to kind of secure that amount of time that then can be carried forward with you and then you can continue that in the next school that you go into I do say that you know technically you can complete your ECT induction in six different schools doing a term in each I would yeah. not advocate it because no. I don't think you'd uh, give yourself the best opportunity to meet the standards in that way yeah. but in theory yes you could do it that way and if someone was say, to say do a term supply or employed for a term and then and leaves and then has a break, so they don't immediately get supply or don't immediately go into another job, how long a break? Is there, is there a rule? I don't know. Is there a rule about how long a break could you have? So you banked that term, but then is there a point in which you say, no, actually, you need to start again? isn't that provision isn't made in the in the guidance at all so if you were to do a term and then two years later you pick it up again that term is still banked and secured for you the only slight it is interesting because i often get asked this and not, there's a misconception about five years mm. but, uh, your qts only lasts you for five years but if you don't start induction mm. that's actually that's not true at all you could go and work overseas for 15 years and then come back to having never completed induction having worked yeah. overseas in a non-british school um you could then come back to the uk and pick up induction at that point your qts doesn't expire the five-year confusion comes from short-term supply so the caveat in the guidance states, states that you can only undertake short-term supply for five years before completing induction so if 
you haven't completed your induction within five years, you can no longer do short term supply roles after that five years. But it doesn't mean you can't pick up a full time teaching job or a long term supply role, but you have to start your induction at that point. OK, so you can't you can only dip in and out of the day kind of supply. Yeah. Or the week hither and thither supply for five years. Otherwise, yes. you kind of essentially lose your QTS status. But oh, you don't lose a QTS status, but yeah. you have to start induction. So you can't continue to do short term supply, but you could pick up, say, a part time one day a week job and then do supply alongside that. Right. So it's. But if I if I suddenly found myself seven years down the line and I've only you know, so I, I did my PGCE, say at Worcester. Yeah. I um then for whatever reason I found myself seven years of doing short term day here, day there supply for seven years. Can I now say, oh, actually from January I'm gonna pick up my ECT, start my ECT? Yes. So in theory you shouldn't have got to seven years because somebody should be keeping an eye on <laughs> on that. Because you I feel like I said it's that maximum of five years. It's one of those things that I don't I've never known it enforced right? because I've never known anybody in that position. Most people do tend to pick up um, kind of the um, more full time or the yes. uh, kind of permanent or um, longer term uh, roles um, before that point. But yeah, you would get to five years and then you could, if you then did, OK, five years of supply, actually, I'm not managing a security job. I'm going to go and, you know, pick up a, a role as a teaching assistant, for example, or HRTA. And then picked up a teaching job that would be absolutely fine so effectively you could secure your qts and then 20 years later start mm. your teaching at that point historically there used to be a return to teaching yes course short-term yes. course yes. to return that no longer exists and um so that's where again that it's the QTS that you've gained and you've earned you've worked hard for mm -hmm. doesn't expire so that's okay, that that's is protected. yours to keep it is absolutely that is yours it's about that engagement with induction when you you know during your teaching career to be able to kind of secure that and then help you move forward but yeah the the five-year rule comes into effect when it's short-term supply but you could teach the in the, in the independent sector your entire career and yeah. never complete induction yes or in the international sector exactly yeah and but as well i think just thinking of it logistically and offering advice it's not a great strategy to have many years out because that's when we do and in my in my previous role in teacher education we have had periodically um contact from people that say do you do a return because it's not just about having to do a return they lack confidence because they've only been doing supply or they took up a ta role for so many years and and they feel that they want a refresher and that really isn't funded or available anymore so don't leave it so long no, absolutely and i think when you're talking about those kind of those gaps i think it depends on what you're doing in those gaps mm -hmm. as well when you're looking to apply for for roles and often i get ects panicking because they think oh i'm not i don't feel ready for you know they've completed their training and for whatever whatever reason that's personal with them they don't feel ready to go into a teaching role at that point and they're worried about damaging their career and I think it depends on the kind of role if you know it's something like a teaching assistant role an HRTA role PPA cover that you know has that less kind of accountability to it there's still accountability there but not quite as full as a class teacher's role that as long as you're demonstrating the impact it's had on you what you've gained from it and how it's supporting you I think it can still be a really valuable experience to share and support you in those applications for a full time teaching position further down the line. Yeah, OK, I'm going to circle back a little bit now to um, a response in from one of your previous questions, because I know that people will um, ECTs worry about this. And we do. Again, it's some of the questions that I know we see on Twitter. Um, failing your ECT. Now that's the worry. People even start worrying about this when they're on their teacher training. Um, so can can you fail it? At what point can you fail it? Or what are the situations if you get to the end point and you are not meeting the standards, what are the options? There are many questions there for you, but they're kind of all wrapped up together. Yeah, I remember when I started my teacher training, um, there was no induction. 
and it was introduced I was the first year to have to do the formal one year induction and the way like you said the wave of panic that went through our course oh my good lord what's going on here you know we've you know we've, we've come into this and, it, and it, we could still fail at some other point um done yet. <laughs> yeah absolutely it is very rare I, like I said 17 NQTs I'd supported none of them ultimately failed their NQT year there were, were points where some were at risk of not meeting the standards and that's where that you can still receive that so at the moment in your assessment points that you have so you have the two formal assessment points the one at the end of each year and those progress reviews in those progress reviews it could be that you know it is identified that you're at risk of not meeting the standards mm -hmm. that can be feel a bit of a blow but what that should mean is then the school and the appropriate body put more support in place for you to help you get there the onus then becomes on the school to support you in getting you back on track to meeting the standards Obviously, yes, there is an amount of work that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to, you know, accept that support and utilise it and move, use it to move your practice forward. But ultimately, it's about then getting new support. You have not failed that term. So, for example, you know, using the um, conversation we were talking about earlier, if you were doing a long term supply for a term from September to December, and at the end of that, they said, oh, actually, we have some, you know, there is a concern you may not be on track to meet the standards at that point then you have still banked that term you have not failed that term you don't have to repeat it and and you cannot fail your early career teacher induction until the end so which end feels of year two. Like end of year two which does feel a bit like I'm going to go through all this year two and then suddenly I'm going to find out I failed at the end those progress review points and the, that assessment at the end of year one should mean there are no surprises. Mm. And when you sit down to those meetings, there shouldn't be any surprise conversations happening there that you aren't aware of. So chances are, if there is that conversation about not having, not being on track to meet the standards, you will have known about that previously. And when I've had to do that with um, NQTs, and I have had some that have been at that position for sometimes reasons outside of their control, you know it's about having that conversation really early on so when that meeting comes it's about okay look this is where we are we're capturing this point in time it's a snapshot of where you are at the moment it's not saying this is where you're going to end up because mm -hmm. actually we're going to do a lot to support you so yes so you can't fail until the end what i always signpost any and i used to print a copy for my nqts i used to give them a copy of the appeals procedure guidance because it's one of those documents that you hope you never need, but you need to know is there to support you because it talks about how you can best support yourself. So if you get to the point where you are at risk of not meeting the standards or you get to the end and it's becoming clear that you are going to fail and it won't because, you know, like I said, a lot of experience, 17 years and 17 80, um, NQTs and none of them that got to that point that you know the process that you can go through to appeal that decision and what sort of evidence you can be gathering along that that pathway in order to if that decision is made at the end then you can then you've got everything you need to be able to support you and to be able to challenge effectively and to know what's coming up but it is like i said it's not going to be a bolt out of the blue at that point there will be a clear indication of this is the trajectory that you're on so you will know but like i said it's highly unlikely and, you know, I know there was a lot of concern over it going to two years that people were worried about two years of extra judgment, extra pressure. But actually, it gives you two years to be able to complete induction rather than it used to be the one. Yes. So, so you've got long, longer to develop. And if you're exactly. struggling in certain areas, you've got longer to access support, CPD yes. and develop. The only, I suppose, if there is a surprise, that's when you invoke the appeal. So if yes. all of your progress reviews and year one um, assessment points have been all positive and then suddenly this is kind of muted towards the end. Now, that's extremely rare and even more rare than people not passing. But occasionally, for whatever reason, and it could be a change in personnel, perhaps sometimes or a change in culture in a school across the time that's when you reach for your appeal document and say, well, I, I had no idea. Yes. Yeah, and the other thing at that point is if you are getting to that point, you would, hopefully you're already in a union, 
but that was when you would speak to your union as well and they will be able to guide you and offer that support because sometimes it can mean just having an advocate at your meetings for you to be able to take those things on because it's it can be quite an emotional time if you feel you are if you have been kind of advised that you're not at risk or you are at risk of not meeting the standards by the end sometimes you are you're not in a place to be receptive to what else is being said in that meeting so having an advocate there from a union can be really supportive so you know hopefully you're in a union anyway but if not that would be a point where you would also reach out to you and say look I've had this conversation I've looked at the appeals guidance what other advice and support can you offer me and then that will always be forthcoming and again the appropriate body will be there to support as well to be able to guide and and support okay so essentially all of it's formative it is until the end point yeah and if if you are flagged as having on you potentially not meeting the standards I would always say to people don't take it sort of to heart as if you're failing don't interpret it as if you're failing because all this is is an indicator we're all developing and we'll all always have areas for development so your subject knowledge might be really strong but your your behavior management and behavior for learning strategies might be a weaker point but be open to that at that point so don't shut down and bury your head in the sand and be quite negative and defensive it's at that point you take it away have your sort of moment because it is disappointing and you do feel frustrated cross angry sad all of those emotions but then go back in and schedule a meeting with your mentor and your tutor and say how can I you know what can I do and as you said you know there can be many reasons why this happens and it could be you know you've gone from teaching year five to teaching EYFS you know there could be a myriad of reasons why th there's a, a kind of a, a dip in your progress against the standards because you're you know or you're moving schools and yeah. it's a lot of ECTs are always surprised how almost how exhausting it is kind of starting at a new school because there's so much new information coming at you you know you're having to learn sometimes almost feels like a new language the terms that schools use for different things and mm -hmm. you know new systems new processes new people new children there's so many pieces of information that come at you in that time it is it, it's full on and actually that can you know dip in your performance because it's not it, it's just that extra burden that's coming at you at that moment in time but like as Catherine said don't take it personally accept the support ask for support and reach out and one thing I will say to you regardless this is my biggest piece of advice I always say is if you are finding things tough talk to somebody so many ECTs uh, NQTs that I work with and this is I feel a, a real benefit of the current system now with that mentor and induction tutor role being separated but the mentor shouldn't have any impact on that judgments against the standards mm. whereas as an NQT mentor previously you had both those roles you had that role of support and that role of judgment and often NQTs and I would always say at the start you know you'd be honest with me yes I know I'm coming in and I'm going to be making those judgments against the standards but also I will support you I will be your champion I will help you get there but mm. I need to know when you're finding things difficult and I think it's very early on because that relationship isn't there they don't know you very well often NQTs would not volunteer things would not tell me things because they were that fear of that judgment rather than seeing it as a see reaching out for support mm -hmm. and the amount of times you, you would pick things up and they would just be then in tears they would have those breakdowns and you know out of all the 17 NQTs I mentored only one of them didn't cry at me at some point during the year because it, it, it's full on and things do get on top of you at times but always, always reach out for support. If you know you're finding something tricky, ask for that support. It will always be given, mm. but you know you have to be open and transparent about that. And I always say it's much easier to catch somebody as they're falling than it is to kind of lift them back up off the ground again. So please, please, please reach for support. Yeah, and, and also I think it, it's really important to acknowledge, and whilst it doesn't look like this for some people when you're very new in your career, when you look at more experienced members of staff it doesn't look it looks like it's easy and it should be easy should be easy for you too but actually those experienced members of staff 
do reach out for support as well within their own communities, networks, within their school, beyond their school as well. We're, we're all doing it. It doesn't matter. You know, you've said you've been teaching in, in education for 20 years. Um, I think I'm nearer 26 years or something. And I still learn and reach out and ask for advice yeah. all the time, not Absolutely. just occasionally, regularly. Like she said, you know, those experienced teachers are constantly kind of developing those networks and those, those systems of support to be able to have, you know, um, kind of to draw on that kind of collective expertise when you need it. You know, you said about, you know, kind of new experiences. And, you know, when I left school in that last year, I still had about three or four new things that happened to me. So, you know, that was 16 years into a primary teaching career, new things that I hadn't experienced before. You know, okay this is something new and you have to be able to seek that kind of support and advice from others to, to, to kind of get you through and mm. what I often find with ECTs is often they think they gain QTS therefore now they they have the expectation that they should be then perfect or that the school will say okay well you finished your teacher training how you're ready you know you're a teacher and nobody has those expectations of you so don't have them of yourself either you know you are still learning you should still be making mistakes and almost not actively making mistakes but actively trying out things that may lead to you making mistakes because yeah. you want to hone your craft you want to find strategies that work for you work for the pupils that are in front of you you know it's about taking those risks trying things out and learning and, and knowing that that support network is around you yeah. to help you build and develop into the best teacher that you are capable of being and if you're safe and dull yeah. of course you won't make mistakes because you're safe and if you are innovating and and bringing creativity to your craft as a teacher you will sometimes make mistakes um, and that's important to acknowledge I'm going to ask just the final question on the fail, and then we're going to look at things that people can do proactively and positively. But I know uh, the reason we're talking about this is I know this is where we get a lot of questions come through. So I get to the end of year two. There have been things flagged up so that the school's done this absolutely right. They've put support in, but I'm just not going to meet the standards. Is that the end or can I have an extension? What are my options? There are some caveats where an extension could be put in place particularly if it's been for absence right. so you are entitled to a maximum of 30 days absence per year over the whole two years so 60 days effectively mm -hmm. um before an extension is um can right. be forced upon you right. if that yeah. makes sense if for at risk of not meeting the standards it's a little bit of a gray area there can be a short term extension, but realistically, if there is an opportunity being given within that time that has enabled you to meet the standards mm -hmm. and you have not, then it's unlikely that there is going to be an extension there for you. So essentially, I will be forced to extend my ECT year if I've had more than 30 days off in the year. Yes, if it, particularly if it's deemed that actually that time would be beneficial in supporting you meeting the standards right okay there is well, that's a lot of time anyway it is exactly it's yeah, a huge a amount of time and you know we're talking about people you know possibly with a broken leg you know you've got six weeks that you're out of action for yeah. you know you can't be on school site health and safety won't allow you to be on school site in a full cast and things like that so you know it's it's significant absence. It's not that, you know, bit of a tummy bug, mm. bit of a flu in the winter. That's yeah. not going to make the big impacts. Okay. And so, though, if it's deemed that a short extension isn't going to happen, that is it. I can't go back and start my ECT year again no. somewhere else. So, no, induction is a one-shot deal. And that's, that's the thing you have to kind of bear in mind, which is linking back something Catherine said earlier about finding the right school for you and mm. I advocate this so much through Twitter and when you're looking for a job finding the right school for you you're effectively choosing a school that are going to judge you and yeah. support you so choose a school that you are happy doing those two things with you because ultimately yes they're going to make the decision and if it's not the right school for you don't see it as a sign of failing by choosing to look somewhere else that actually what you're doing is you're giving yourself the best opportunity to be successful in the long term Mm. And of course, if you do get to that point and you haven't successfully met the standards, 
and you still desperate to teach and want to invest in yourself and, and you're self-reflective, there are other options, you know, like um, to work in, in institutions that don't require um, yes, yeah. the rubber stamp of that. Yes. Okay. Moving on to something now more proactive and um, you can talk a bit and I'll join in about this. To me, when you start off in teaching, you feel that it's there's a it's a bit of a tsunami of new things to learn, do that you're chasing your tail a little bit. But I think it's never too early. And I've been I wish I'd engaged earlier in my career in this in hindsight, which is a wonderful thing. But I think building of networks, both internally, of course, your internal uh, support network networks from your colleagues. And even if you're in sort of collaborative or collaborating schools, that's important. But look beyond to really gain differing perspectives and support beyond your school where you can take things. And um, as I said in the introduction, I co-host um, the EC, monthly ECT network that Bowden Education runs with you, which is open to all ECTs, primary, secondary, working in special schools, but also for student teachers, actually, because it's a really useful place to go. Um, what do you think attending something like that is? So that runs monthly, you pop along, it's really informal. We sort of take questions, offer our sort of words of wisdom. Um, why is that so important? What can you benefit from that as an ECT or trainee teacher? Exposing yourself to other ideas, other people, those networks is, is a beneficial thing, even if it's sometimes, you know, you might have the opportunity to speak to anything. Actually, I wouldn't do it that way. And that's absolutely fine as well. You know, you can find ways of thinking, actually, I don't align with that and I don't wouldn't want to work in that way. But, you know, having that breadth of, of kind of experience to draw on, as Catherine said, you'll develop that within your own school. And I always talk about finding your tribe within a school, finding those mm -hmm. people that are not going to create an echo chamber. They're not going to tell you everything you're doing is marvellous and wonderful, and, but that are going to challenge you in a positive way. You know, they ignite you, they energise you about teaching. So mm -hmm. branching out that network and looking at those wider networks you can join into, so they like Bowder Network, for example, you can find others that you can connect with and think actually I think I could learn a lot from you mm. and actually I think I can offer you something as well you know that kind of that shared um, kind of collective knowledge that can help you develop it also can help you be energized about the role that you're doing as I said about finding your tribe what you want to do is kind of engage with things that you think actually I love teaching and I want to speak to other people who also love teaching mm. that are inspired to kind of go on to do better because then that will inspire you to go on and be better. And it's about building that momentum that actually allows you to find ways then to have that kind of longer career because you've got that, that sense of purpose, that sense of network, and also that self-efficacy that comes with that, that knowing by learning from others actually gives you more confidence in you as an individual mm -hmm. and knowing that you can affect change and you can make a difference that allows you then to kind of build that momentum and be generally really successful in your career yeah and I always think that it can be daunting yeah without a doubt um I do think that and but don't fear this feel that you can just rock up to one of these sessions and be fairly passive to begin with you don't yes. have to talk you can pop in the chat and or you can just sit back and watch but I just think taking that first step is the hardest um, in terms of bravery if you if you find things a little bit daunting but I do think it it's revolutionary and I think having absolutely your networks within your own school and within your own um, if you're a student teacher you know within your own course is really really important and it, this isn't to replace that but having that extra layer sort of out the edge is really important and I think you can meet some really fantastic people where you can actually spark off ideas and say do you know what we're working on something similar shall we shall we work together we might work at opposite ends of the country but you know we're all very good at technology now and um we can get together and and do something and that's where the excitement for me is as well as saying do you know what I've sat and listened today and I go away and I feel that I'm not the only one that's struggling with X. So sometimes you can feel better in the fact that you're not on your own. And it's one of those things I think teaching is it's quite a 
lovely job. And I know that sounds like a really strange thing to say because you're surrounded by people all the time, but you're often in a classroom with with, with children or young yeah. adults, yeah. and it's not it's not the same. You don't get that interaction. So being able to find other adults to kind of to talk to, to kind of reach out to, to as kind of said, to know that you're you're not alone in what you're experiencing. And you know, COVID has you know had lots of negative impacts on our society and. You know, I lead um, some ECF training and actually sometimes those online sessions, not being in a sat in a room together, like the day conferences, not being in a room together. I don't think you, you do. You don't get to have those informal conversations that you learn gain a lot from. Exactly. And actually the benefit of COVID is it's developed out a use of technology in such a way. You know, I would have never connected with Catherine in the same way, you know, initially without kind of this technology that we're using now to be able to support us. So I think yeah. COVID has some real benefits to it and that ability to connect with people and bring in experts from across the country to that place to be able to listen to, to learn from, to gain ideas with, to be able to ask questions about very specific to your setting. Mm-hmm. just would have been unheard of previous to this you know you would have had to kind of travel huge distances there's a huge cost implication but yeah. you know it's a much but now we way. sometimes just say oh let's have a catch up and a coffee I don't yeah. think pre-covid I've ever said that about let's let's go online and have a coffee yeah. um and I think that's great because then you can mm-hmm. just you know half an hour coffee and reach out how's things going with you and you know it ignites those kind of excitement so definitely I would say my advice to trainee teachers ECTs and any other teachers actually um head teachers the lot um look at your networks because they can be so enriching our next ECT network for November is on the 10th of the month and we do them monthly and we we generally have a special guest sometimes we are the experts talking on the field we're coming up soon Andy as having our own little bit but in November we've got David Gumbrell talking about resilience and a really important topic so David will be quite happy to chat about it but take again any questions that you have and it's completely informal not recorded never going to go anywhere so um, do come along and have a look at our website and I'll put that in the podcast notes where you can access the book into those Okay, last question about this before we just round up. Um, You've got a book out in the new year. I have, it's very exciting. I'm I'm waiting for the final, final copy to arrive just to be able to say, yes, it's all going, which is really exciting. And I feel absolutely imposter syndrome being able to do this, but uh, yeah, it is really exciting. You shouldn't feel imposter because you are Mr. T's (laughs) NQT's. But the book is called You Can Do This and you can pre-order it on Amazon. You can look on Bowden Education's um, like publications or book recommendation site and link to it from that. But it will be out in the new year. What can, and I've read it, so thank you for that because I've uh, endorsed, done an endorsement for this book. So I have had a privilege of having a read through already. But what can ECTs expect by we sell it? You see your moment. <laughs> I think if you follow me on Twitter, then you'll kind of know what I do on there. It's about that positive support, being able to kind of sign posts, being able to offer advice and guidance and things. And the books allow me to do it in more than 156 characters, I think it is on Twitter, you're kind of restricted to. So it's allowed me to go into more depth and things. And it is, it's a book that you can pick up at any point. If there are particular, it's grouped around particular areas that you might require more support with, you might want to just explore a little bit in more depth. But equally, you know, you can read through it chronologically as well. It was it was set up to help you understand that what is the expectations of you as an ECT and what you should be expecting, but also then that real kind of focus guidance and support on different areas that you may come across during the year. So, you know, the first parents evening, it's a chapter in there about working with parents and building those relationships with parents. Um, if you're you know, struggling with behaviour management, there's a chapter in there to support you with setting and establishing really clear expectations. So there's different things in there that you can dip in and out of at different points in time. But I've very much given it, uh, if structured it around that sense of this is my support advice, but also opportunities for you to reflect as well. Yeah. And, you know, kind of coaching questions, just getting you to think about actually where, where's your point of knowledge at the moment? What is it you want to develop further? What do you know? And one of the things I was really, really pleased with, and um, was able to do was to get um kind of extracts quotes so or reflections from ects that are out there at the moment and to share 
their experiences and their thoughts on the different focuses of each chapter there's an ECT reflecting and sharing their experience which is you know hugely beneficial because you get again you get to know that it's not just you and you can learn from each other mm. as well definitely so keep a look out for that so in um in summary uh it it's really important to engage and understand the role of your mentor and your tutor and know who your appropriate body is check that you're getting the remission time that you are uh, entitled to and that the progress review points are formative and supportive as is the end of year one assessment point so do take on board those pieces of advice and areas for improvement and don't panic at that point um, that's really important another thing if you are an ECT or in in your training years we do have a podcast that we had out earlier in the autumn series which is with Lakita Neal who is herself an ECT and shares her experiences so that might be worth looking at so Andy to round us up two quick questions at the end what's been your greatest achievement to date oh, it's a really tricky one. It's, it's, I, keep, I often get asked this question and doing things like this and it it always sounds really I always find it really sounds quite trite almost but actually it's knowing the impact I've made on on others and that awareness that actually there are teachers head teachers out there deputy head teachers they're the lecturers that are doing what they're doing because of the impact that I've had on them and that in, in them being being their champion and helping them to support that they're giving them the self-belief that they can do whatever they set out to do and is there an ambition you still hope to achieve in your career oh that's a good one um I think probably going forward is I would like to be able to do more to be kind of that voice that advocate for ECTs to be able to kind of continue to do that at, and again being the champion for every ECT out there to be able yeah. to give them that opportunity to know that there's somebody there that's fighting to give them kind of what they deserve and the support that they should be having. Brilliant so thank you so much Andy you can follow Andy on Twitter on the handle at Mr T's underscore NQTs and you can pre-order his book on at any of your favourite um, or go-to book sellers. But as I say, if you can't find it, pop onto the Bowden site, www.bowdeneducation.org, and you can find it in our books there. And I hope it um, sells as it should. It's a great accompaniment to sit on the desk of every ECT so they can dip into it. So thank you so much for the chat today, Andy. Thank you very much, Catherine. Absolute pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.